Long before Diana, Princess of Wales, there was already a British royal princess who garnered the adoration of the British public. This was Princess Charlotte Augusta of Wales, the daughter of Prince George and the granddaughter of King George III. Charlotte was greatly admired in the early 19th century, but like Diana later, her life was cut tragically short. This is her story. Princess Charlotte Augusta of Wales was born on the 7th of January 1796 at Carlton House in London. Her father was George, Prince of Wales, the heir to the throne of Britain. Despite being heir to the throne, George remained a bachelor well into his thirties, and had not produced an heir of his own. This was on account of his being involved in a long-standing relationship with Maria Fitzherbert, a commoner and Catholic, grounds which precluded George from being able to legally marry her if he wanted to one day be king. Well, there were laws in place which prohibited the spouse of a Roman Catholic from succeeding to the British throne. Therefore, George had remained unwed but engaged in a relationship with Fitzherbert for much of the late 1780s and 1790s. It was only in the spring of 1795 that he eventually caved to his father's demands to marry and produce an heir. Thus, George was to marry Caroline of Brunswick, a German princess who was also his first cousin. George and Caroline detested each other from the very beginning of their relationship. Nevertheless, they married on the 8th of April 1795. George would later state that they only laid together as man and wife on three occasions, and then never again. This occurred during the first weeks of their union. Charlotte was the product of their very brief sexual relationship, and she was born almost exactly nine months after her parents' wedding day. The day after she was born, Prince George began plotting to separate his newborn child from her mother. It was the beginning of 20 years of scheming on her father's part, which would constantly create difficulties for Charlotte. By this time, he and his wife Caroline were already living apart in separate households, and less than a year after their wedding, the prince was also back in his relationship with Maria Fitzherbert. Charlotte was raised in her own household, overseen by the Dowager Countess of Elgin, who acted as her governess. This was a conventional arrangement for the children of royalty in 18th century Britain, but what was unusual was that, in her younger years, Charlotte did not visit her parents together. Instead, she was sent to seeing them in different households in London and other parts of England, though George did his best to thwart his estranged wife in this. He did not have an entirely free hand, however, as Charlotte's grandfather, the King, tended to block his son's efforts to limit the contact between Charlotte and Caroline. Prince George was forced to acquiesce to his father on many occasions, as he had a serious gambling problem, and frequently had to turn to the king for money to pay his debts. This gave King George leverage over his son, and he used this to try and protect his granddaughter. Over time, Charlotte's father began to largely ignore his daughter, whose appearance increasingly reminded him too much of his wife Caroline, and her presence in London continued to annoy him. As a result, in 1804, the king himself offered to take custody of Charlotte, but George blocked this, fearing that Charlotte would be given too much access to her mother if she was made a ward of the king and queen. Meanwhile, Charlotte continued to be raised at Warwick House. There, her education was entrusted to the Bishop of Exeter, John Fisher. Under his oversight, a range of tutors were provided to educate the princess in writing, history, religion, literature, Latin, drawing, music and dance. Her governess and various tutors remarked frequently in their correspondence that the young princess was growing into a spirited child who wasn't afraid to speak her mind. The tortuous relationship between Charlotte's parents was especially difficult as it made Charlotte her father's only legitimate heir and the couple wouldn't go on to have any other children. This meant that she was second in line to the throne of Britain from her birth, and this was particularly significant, for her grandfather, King George III, 
had suffered from psychological problems for many years. What has been referred to colloquially as the madness of King George III remains only partially understood down to the present day. Beginning in the mid-1780s, he began to suffer bouts of severe mood swings, often being manic for days on end, and then crashing into states of depression. Sometimes he would talk listlessly, and he had a worrying tendency to refer to individuals who were long dead as though they were still present in the world. However, this behaviour was periodic, and generally speaking, George bounced back after several days or weeks. Because medical knowledge was limited at the time, it is not exactly clear what the king suffered from, but the best modern assessments suggest it was acute porphyria, a liver disorder which causes chemicals to build up in one's blood and effectively begins to poison them, though in a way which causes increasing psychological instability and other maladies rather than killing the individual. Although he recovered from his severe bout in 1788 and was able to resume his duties as king, the possibility of another psychological collapse was never far from the minds of the royal family and those at the heart of the British government. This all had implications for Charlotte. If her grandfather was rendered incapacitated again, then her father would become king in all but name, and she would be next in line to the throne. This meant that, Charlotte though still a child, was a very significant person within Britain. It was also inevitable that her marriage would become an issue of political significance as soon as she was old enough to marry. And that is exactly what happened. In 1810, King George slipped into a final bout of dementia. It would last for 10 years before he would eventually die in 1820. Sadly, his last days were spent alone, talking to long dead friends, as his doctors believed at the time that the best treatment was not to have him overly disturbed. Prince George now became Regent of Britain, King in all but name. The 1810s are consequently known as the Regency period. Charlotte, who was upset by her grandfather's demise, as she and he had been close, and because he had sought to protect her from the plotting of her father, would now unfortunately become an increasing focus of political scheming in the 1810s, even though she was just entering her teenage years. Once his full regency powers were confirmed in 1810, Prince George restricted his 14-year-old daughter's correspondence and limited her contact with her mother to one supervised visit every two weeks. However, even as he sought to control her, the princess was developing a reputation for having a free will. Shortly after her father became regent, a political battle developed in London when the prince refused to form a government made out of politicians from the Whig party, the more liberal parliamentary group which the king had largely supported during his reign. When attending the opera in the capital in the midst of this, Charlotte, who shared her grandfather's political leanings, had made a point of blowing kisses in the direction of the Whig leader, Lord Grey. The public had noted this, largely with approval. However, her father was furious and began restricting Charlotte further, reducing the amount of money available to her household to barely enough to maintain herself, and insisting that henceforth she sit in some out of the way back seat when attending the opera. Evidently, news of her father's harsh treatment was becoming common knowledge, making him more unpopular. Meanwhile, by 1812, Charlotte was generally being greeted by cheering crowds on the rare occasions when she was allowed to appear in public. By this time, Charlotte was 16, and the issue of her marriage was becoming significant. Moreover, the wars in Europe were drawing to a conclusion, and the marriage was seen as a means of Britain tying some other royal house to it. Ever since the 1790s, Britain had been involved in almost continuous war with France. First, the revolutionary republican government there, and then the regime of Napoleon Bonaparte, who was Emperor of France, came to dominate much of the continent. The royal lines which had been overthrown by Napoleon in many countries would soon be re-established, and it was with one of these, the princely House of Orange in the Netherlands, that Prince George wished to establish greater ties. Thus, 
Charlotte was to marry Prince William of Orange in order to secure greater British influence in northwestern Europe. At first, Charlotte reluctantly agreed to marry the prince in December 1813, but by the early spring of 1814, she was willfully resisting. The princess worried that, if she did, she would dwell in Holland thereafter, and her mother, who had few remaining allies in England, would then be entirely at the mercy of her father. Accordingly, she broke off the engagement, refusing to follow her father's wishes. George reacted in typical form. He dismissed Charlotte's household servants and further restricted her finances. This was a cruel blow, as many of these servants were effectively Charlotte's lifelong companions, individuals such as Cornelia Knight, whom she had known since she was a child. He then banished Charlotte to Cranbourne Lodge in Windsor Forest. Here, she was only to be allowed one visitor, her mother, who would visit once a week. It was in this context that Charlotte's mother took the rather noble decision to leave England and return to Germany. This was what George had effectively wanted her to do for the last 18 years. Now, he had his wish, and as a result, Charlotte's treatment by her father improved considerably. The princess was now out of her isolation, and in late August of 1814, she went to the seaside in Weymouth. As Charlotte's coach stopped along the way, large friendly crowds gathered to see her. Once she arrived at the seaside town, there were illuminations with a centipede stating, Hail Princess Charlotte, Europe's hope and Britain's glory. This just goes to show how much the British people loved her, and that they already thought of her as their future queen. By 1815, Charlotte had formed a relationship with another young noble suitor. At some stage in 1814, she had met Prince Leopold of the house of saxe coburg saffeld at a party in London. He soon began calling on her, and the pair became affectionate to one another. An engagement followed soon after, and on the 2nd of May 1816, they were wed, with huge crowds lining the streets of London. The young royal couple made their home in Claremont in Surrey. It was a happy union, and Charlotte remained as popular as ever with the British public. When Charlotte became pregnant in 1817, it seemed as though her past tribulations had finally resolved, and a happy future had opened up before her. But tragedy struck. The pregnancy was complicated, and in early November, Charlotte went into labour. This lasted 50 hours, and resulted in a stillborn son. It soon became a double tragedy. A few hours after the birth, Charlotte began vomiting violently, and complained of pains in her abdomen. Also, her postpartum bleeding did not stop. Her physician, Sir Richard Croft, noticing how cold she was, called for Leopold to be brought, but by the time her husband was awakened and brought to her room, Charlotte was dead. The beloved princess was just 21 years old when she passed, and her death was met with an outpouring of public grief. The mourning was such that linen drapers ran out of black cloth, shops closed for two weeks, and even the poor and homeless tied armbands of black on their clothes. Henry Broom wrote the following regarding the princess's death. It really was as though every household throughout Britain had lost a favourite child. Charlotte was then buried in St George's Chapel, Windsor Castle, with her son at her feet, on the 19th of November 1817. Her physician, Richard Croft, was so criticised over her death that he took his own life a few months later. Her death also ended the direct line of succession. Prince George had no other legitimate children, and unless he and Caroline divorced and he remarried, and had more heirs, the line of succession would now fall to George III's other children when Prince George himself died. Interestingly, at this time, George III had 12 living legitimate children, but no legitimate grandchildren. Thus, a race was on among his sons, the royal dukes, to marry and produce an heir. This is why almost all of George III's legitimate grandchildren were born after Charlotte's death. After George III died in 1820, Prince George officially became king as George IV. 
His own reign only lasted until 1830, at which time his younger brother William ascended as William IV. However, William had no legitimate heir either, and so when he in turn died in 1837, the throne descended to the young Princess Victoria, the 18-year-old daughter of Prince Edward, Duke of Kent, the fourth son of King George III. Thus, had Charlotte not died in 1817 and given birth to an heir, Queen Victoria, who is known as the Grandmother of Europe and whose reign spanned the period of Britain's primacy as the world superpower, would never have become Queen of Britain. Although Charlotte isn't well remembered today, this could be seen as one of history's great what-ifs, as had she lived longer, the history of Britain and Europe may have been very different. Thank you everyone for watching this video on Princess Charlotte Augusta of Wales, I hope you found it interesting. Let me know what you thought of her life down below in the comments, and if you have any suggestions, also leave them in the comments. I hope you guys are subscribed and have notifications turned on to get all my videos as soon as I upload them. Anyway, that's all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.